as I do, I look at that clock to get a barometer on the time. I'll give the title, as I do anymore, of the sermon. When we betray God and man. When we betray God and man. I want to speak about that today. That word betray. And how that always is coming into play in our relationship with one another. And most of all, ultimately, with God. Basically, up front, the word betray simply means broken trust. That would be the best way from my sense of, you know, giving a definition. You know, I looked at a lot of definitions of the word betray. You know how it is. You go on the Internet. You can go to Merriam-Webster, Dictionary.com, Free Dictionary, Cambridge Dictionary, and on and on it goes. And they all basically, you know, are going to tell you much the same thing, but it all comes down to broken trust in a relationship. Betrayal and to betray someone happens when that trust is broken in that relationship. And I want to talk about that today. And I want to first talk about us first and that sense of betrayal at times with one another in the human realm, and then I will move it to the subject of when we betray God, which is the most serious offense that one could commit. Most of us, if we know our history, if you know American history, and perhaps if God hadn't called me, like I said to some last week in the two churches last week, perhaps had God not called me, Perhaps I'd have been teaching American history and coaching football because those are my loves. Those are some, some of my loves. I have many loves, but those are two of them. And so from American history, most of us, when we think of a traitor, treason, you think of Benedict Arnold. Is anyone out here with the last name Arnold? I don't think so. That name, Benedict Arnold, rings from history as almost like that first person that comes to mind when we talk about history and American history and he, that person who committed treason against his own countrymen. And of course, hopefully you know your history enough to know that it was during the what's called the Revolutionary War, our fight for independence with Mother England, and so how he betrayed the American cause and turned traitorous to the cause and betrayed his countrymen. And forevermore, that name, Benedict Arnold, has been associated with treason, traitorous, to betray. Many of you will remember, maybe if you know American history, how many of you have heard the names Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, Rosenberg, husband and wife, who were convicted of treason and sentenced to die the death penalty in 1953 for divulging secrets to the Soviet Union. That was a different age in America and the world. And they both husband and wife because of their treasonous giving away information, selling it to the Soviet Union as spies, they were executed, husband and wife. That was 1953. Most of us will remember from English literature Remember the story of Julius Caesar and the plot to kill Caesar? And when they carried the plot out, and Brutus, his best friend, also plunged the knife into Caesar. And remember those famous words that we learned in English literature? And it was, E tu Brute, you tu Brutus, where his best friend in a betrayal plunged the knife. And by the way, as I give this message today, betrayal betrayal happens most times to those and can who are closest to us. And I don't think any of us, if we're adults in this room, you can look back in your life and maybe even presently, sad to say, and know someone who betrayed you that you trusted. Because again, what I talk about today, whether with God or man, 
and a betrayal deals with broken trust, which leads to broken relationships. And the ultimate definition, one might say, of a betrayal is to be or become unfaithful in that relationship. To be unfaithful or to become unfaithful in a relationship. And that happens with each other, and it happens with God as well. You know, we can go to the Bible, and there are so many stories of betrayal all through the Bible. If you know the Bible relatively well even, and certainly if you have studied the Bible much over your lifetime, the Bible is full of betrayals. I mean, you could just lecture and lecture and lecture on stories of betrayal throughout the Bible. Because, again, it is about broken trust and relationships that ended because of that unfaithfulness that happened between that relationship. You know, maybe the greatest is Christ himself. Christ was betrayed by his own people. And we know the story that he was betrayed by Judas, betrayed by a kiss. You know, that's been called the kiss of death. That's where that old term, I guess, came from, the kiss of death. Linda, you might want to check that out as an idiom and see if I'm right on that. He gave him the kiss of death in a betrayal there in the Garden of Gethsemane that night. And you know the story, Christ betrayed by his own people. And they came to the point where they shouted, crucify him. We don't not only acknowledge him as the Messiah, we don't accept him so perhaps that's the greatest betrayal in one sense of it all because our very Lord and Master and Savior, Jesus Christ himself, was betrayed. What about Peter? And I'll say something about Peter more in a little while in the sermon. But Peter denied Christ three times that night. And so I will say something a little bit later about that. One of the greatest betrayals of Scripture from the Old Testament, David, King David, betraying Uriel. You talk about a betrayal. Uriel loved his king, was extremely, totally loyal to his king. And David, King David, set him up and framed him to be killed, murdered in battle so that he might have his wife Bathsheba after the adultery and as a cover-up plot and we know the story as it went along, as it ended in that sense, about how David repented, yes. But even though he repented, we know the story about how he paid a severe price, a severe price for that betrayal. When through the prophet Nathan, God had told Nathan the prophet to say to David, because of what you have done, the sword will not depart from your house. And it didn't. David lived to be 70. That's my age. And I've told people David was an old man at 70 because David had lived in the fast lane of life. When you consider the life of David, King David, and you know the life of King David, David, that old expression, had lived in the fast lane of life. And he was an old man at 70. And he died. And then the original betrayal. If I were to ask you, what was the original betrayal and maybe the greatest betrayal up to this point? It was Lucifer. And you find that story without turning there in Isaiah 14. We've been there many times. Isaiah 14, you can read about verses 12 through 15 especially. Lucifer betrayed his very creator. God had created him. God had fashioned him, molded him. Created him at that time, no doubt, the most beautiful creation that he had created at that time. The anointed cherub at the throne of God. And we know that in his beauty, in his pride, he was lifted up. He was a covering at the throne of God. Brethren, I don't know sometimes if you allow yourself to think and meditate about some of those words in Scripture. He was a covering at God's throne. He was an elevated creation, and yet that wasn't enough. And he betrayed God himself and the very God that had created him. And he did what? He caused a third of the angels 
to betray God as well in that great deception. What did you have there? What do you always have when you have a betrayal that happens? You have broken trust, unfaithfulness. The trust was broken between God and that part of the angelic realm that chose to leave God, disobey God, war against God. So there are many stories in the Bible about betrayal. And I just mentioned one to kind of polish it off. You could do a whole sermon about it. Joseph, betrayed by his brothers. So the Bible is full of those stories. In the human realm, when you think about it, and we are honest with each other, and that's always the toughest thing for each of us most of the time is to be honest with one another. In fact, I would say too much of the time we cannot even be honest with our own self. So much of the time we cannot even look into the mirror at our own self and be honest with our own self. But how often do we betray one another? Have you ever thought about it? Again, what is betrayal? Betrayal is that which breaks trust. Trust between one another. Trust in relationships is like the super glue that holds relationships together. And when that trust is broken, I've lived a life of 70 years and I've seen the best of friendships broken and never put back together again. Husband and wife, and when there is even infidelity and things of that nature, that trust factor becomes broken. Trust is such a rich spiritual commodity, and it is of the essence to remain faithful because I'm talking today about relationship, that relationship with one another, and then ultimately with God most of all. And how that we betray one another at times when we don't even sometimes think about it. What about through gossip, slander, innuendos, hinting at things about somebody, undermining, being critical of someone. See, you could take this in an infinite way, so to speak, almost, of how we can betray one another in our human relationships. We find in Matthew 24, verse 10, without turning there, I just quote from it, the Olivet Prophecy. In the Olivet Prophecy, Christ said in Matthew 24, verse 10, and again, a prophecy that deals with the latter times, the end of the age, and then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Let's just put the focus for a moment on this nation and the world around us. Let's just put the focus more at home in the United States of America. Do you see many being offended now? Do you see many hating one another? Do you see many betraying one another? We're seeing a betrayal among all constituents, it seems, on every front in the three branches of government, among the people themselves. It seems that everywhere you look, you're seeing betrayals that are happening. And it was prophesied. Christ said this is what would happen. And that all of that prophecy, that verse that says, and this generation will not pass to all these things be fulfilled. I am convinced that we're living in that generation. And we're seeing these things now come to pass. And many would be offended and betray one another. Always in the human potential, the realm of human potential, we all have that capacity, you might say, to betray one another at times. And we can betray one another in, in so many ways, spoken word, actions, because it always has to do with that essence of trust. Every relationship, each of you sitting out here today, listening in, who will hear the message later, 
every relationship in the human realm that you are involved in right now is most solidified by that trust factor. Trusting that person that you're in a relationship with. And when that trust is broken, you know what I'm talking about. If you are an adult listening today, or will hear the message, if you are now an adult, you've already found that to be true. And sometimes those closest to you, those that you think you can trust the most, are the ones who will many times betray you. The story of Brutus and Caesar. When Brutus plunged the knife into Caesar, about to, you too, Brutus. And again, Christ's own people betrayed him. We see this essence, and it's all about relationship. Life itself is about relationship. When you bring life and living life every day for each one of us, and that's why I, be, I titled the sermon, When We Betray God and Man. And right now I'm talking about man as in man and woman, humanity, one another. To betray creates a serious offense. In fact, it is really a sin. And that depends on the severity of that broken trust and how deep that betrayal went because betrayal so much of the time, if not the majority of times, involves, involves deception and lies. Lies and deceptions are so much a part, so much the time, of broken trust. And again, that word, to be unfaithful in that relationship. There is no higher relationship on earth. Notice what I said. There is no higher relationship of trust needed than between husband and wife. I don't know that I've ever given, per se, a, a marriage sermon. Perhaps I will eventually, because marriages, we're seeing more marriages than ever fail. And it all comes back to that essence of a relationship and that trust factor has been violated, and again, it comes back to being faithful to your life's partner in every way, and in ways that we sometimes don't even think about, that we don't even sometimes think. It's the little things, is it not? All of us who are in marriage, we understand it is so much those little things that mean the most, and we just don't pay that much attention to it. Perhaps another time, but I'll stay back on topic for the time on this matter today between us as brethren and most of all between us and God. I call it spiritual treason when we who are led, especially by the Holy Spirit, we who have had God invest himself in us, and that again is how succinct it is in my mind is that God has invested in us through and by his Holy Spirit as I gave I am the church two weeks ago just continuing this pattern just this pattern of just this overlapping of messages that I'm hoping to just kind of continue to impress in all of our minds that we serve a great God and this great God expects much out of us and in our relationships he wants to see unity and harmony. And we can only have that when we learn to do those things in that spiritual realm that will promote trust. And every time we do those things that break trust, we wind up having a splintered body, divisions in the body. These are things I'm talking about in the moment with us, with one another. Is this, or is this not, a Satan-inspired world? And there's only one answer to that, affirmative. This is a Satan-led, inspired world. And it will only continue to be that way, except even more so. You know, I said two weeks ago in the sermon, those who are in power now in this nation... 
Those who are now in power in this nation are this close to having absolute power. And there's no turning the clock back. I wrote the personal back where I came from. None of us cannot go back. We cannot go back to the way things were. Those of us who are older in this room, those of us who are really older and have white hair, gray hair, no hair, and we go back a lot of decades, we know that the world we knew only now exists right here in our memories. And we can go back and visit those better times, but those better times are gone. And the only good times now that are going to come is with his kingdom to come. That's it. The only good times now promised are the kingdom, is the kingdom. That's the only thing that's going to bring about the really good times. What's that old, is there a title to a song, Let the Good Times Roll? That would be a good Feast of Tabernacles sermon title, Let the Good Times Roll. I'm speaking in Panama City Beach this year. Maybe I'll remember that line. Let the good times roll, brethren. Because that's why we'll go to the feast. It's for seven days to let the good times roll. Quoting from Todd Beamer. Todd Beamer just popped into my mind, my thoughts. Todd Beamer, that day on that flight, 98, I'm trying to remember the number, 98, the flight going to Pennsylvania. The last words they heard him say as he and his comrades headed for that cockpit. Let's roll. Let's roll, brethren. Let's roll toward the kingdom because there's nothing behind us. Sometimes you get maybe as much from the tangents I get off on. That's why I don't like to be too scripted to my notes. Isaiah 520. Jot it down. I'll quote it. You can turn, but Isaiah chapter 520. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This is the world we now are living in. We didn't just arrive today. We've actually been here for longer than you might realize when you begin to think about it. These friends, these trends started long, long ago. We've been living in this world for a while now and are living in it more and more to where this is what we're witnessing, a prophecy of the prophet Isaiah that the time would come when they would call good, evil, evil, good, and bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. And that's what we're seeing. And I don't need to go through some dialogue or commentary on that because you know some of the specifics within that statement without going there. It's, a, it's an upside-down world. I was there in Matthew 24, verse 10, the verse that follows Matthew 24, 10, verse 11. Matthew 24, verse 11, Christ followed it up. Love of many, the love of many will wax cold toward God and one another. Are we seeing that? Are we seeing the love against one another in this nation, this world, Waxing colder and colder. I might ask in the moment, you feel the blanks in your mind always, where is the love of God right now evident on this earth? Where is the love of God evident now on this earth? I'm supposed to be looking at it. I'm supposed to be looking at that with you, myself, all of us, the saints of God, the church, the disciples of Christ. I went through that two weeks ago when I defined when you say, I am the church. Do you pass that love test? I brought that out in the message two weeks ago when I went to those epistles of John. Are we passing that love test? We are the ones only that are going to be exhibiting, supposed to, the true love of God. And if that love of God is being utilize and practice and inculcate it into our life, then that's going to promote the trust between us and our relationship with one another. Christ had told Peter something at Passover night. I want you to go to Luke 22. Go to Luke 22. 
chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. On Passover night, a very profound and poignant words to the apostle Peter to be that Christ said to him that night. In chapter 22 of Luke, make sure I get there with you. Verse 31. The Lord said to Simon Peter that night, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Look where Christ puts the emphasis that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. And then Peter says in verse 33, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Christ said to Peter, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. And of course, Peter did not accept that. Peter was bold in his declaration that night before what? Before the mob came. Peter was bold to say what he would do before the mob arrived in the garden that night. I will never deny you, he said. And Christ says, yet you will deny me three times. In essence, you will betray me by denial three times. You will deny association with me. And you will do it three times. Peter was told by Christ. And what did Christ address? Your faith. With each of us today, other than the greatest gift of all that God's Spirit supplies us with, and that is the love of God in us, that is the greatest gift as all, as, of all, as we know, is God's love in us. That, that is the supreme gift that comes to and by his nature. God is love. And yet faith, faith is inseparable from true love. If the true love of God is in us, then faith itself will be joined with that love to supply those things which are going to be necessary. And notice how I said going to be necessary before the mob comes. We're here meeting peaceful today. But the mob is coming. The mob is coming. Some of the things I'm tracking that's going on in this nation and world. And it's coming to our doorsteps of the church probably sooner than we realize. Will Satan sift you? The process of our calling itself, the process of our conversion is a sifting process. We are all being sifted and God is going to allow us to be sifted because God's going to find out how much chaff is in the wheat and he's going to separate the chaff from the wheat and we know when Christ comes, Christ says very clearly, when I come, I will separate the sheep from the goats. There is always an ongoing separation that is happening in our lives because God is going to find out, as I've said, and others in the ministry have said and exhorted, God is going to find out where I stand and where you stand, and he's going to find that out, and there's going to be a sifting process always. And I don't think that God allows Total hedges, in fact, I know from Scripture, God does not allow total hedges to be around us that Satan cannot touch us. Satan is being allowed to touch us in ways that sometimes I don't think we think about. And maybe down the line, God, God willing, life, life stays here in me. Subjects that I want to broach as I go along with all of you. Because I understand the seriousness of the times we're now in. It is times we've never witnessed before. And they're going to only get worse. Are there times that we betray God in Christ? Because now I'm moving the subject matter into the ultimate betrayal. 
Are there times and too much of the time that we actually betray God and Jesus Christ? Because what again is involved in a betrayal? It is a broken trust. Are we not engaged in a covenant with God and Jesus Christ? Those things that I have given recent sermons about, what must I do to be saved? Well, I went into belief, repentance, baptism. Are we who have taken those vows, entered into that covenant? Is that covenant being breached at times, broken? And every time we have breach of covenant with God, every time we have a sense of a broken relationship with God, broken trust, it is a betrayal. Anytime we are found to be disobedient to his will, it is a type of betrayal. When I put the sermon together, those of you, the men, you speak, those of you who speak, you know how it is, you may be just kind of sitting there one day driving down the road and all of a sudden this thought hits your mind and you know it is inspired. And men, you know how it is. Let me pull over and write some notes on that. I have pulled over on the side of the road many times over the years and wrote out some sermon notes and get back on the road again because when the thoughts came, I had to write them down. And you know where it comes from. Broken trust, broken covenant equals to be unfaithful to God. And in any manner that we are unfaithful or become unfaithful, even be it through fear, persecution, compromise, it is a betrayal of God. Jesus Christ said in that same chapter 22, verse 22, in that same Luke 22, verse 22, you're probably there still. This is on Passover night. The Son of Man, Christ said, will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. Woe to him who betrays him. You know, Christ says in another place of Scripture, offenses must come. You know, Christ says that in another portion of Scripture. Offenses must come. Or probably better said, offenses will come. But called as long as we're human and as long as we live in this human realm with each other, imperfect, we are going to cause offense at times with one another. But Christ says, but woe to him by which the offense comes. Better to be, as Christ goes on in those passages without turning there from memory, better to be the offended than to be the one doing the offending. Any offense of that nature is a type betrayal again. And again, the church, can I use just real simple English that these children can understand, the church is glued together by trust and faithfulness to one another. And most of all, trust and faithfulness to God. That is the spiritual glue that binds and holds us together. And when that is broken, and when that happens, there is no longer, there is no longer a relationship. Covenant is broken. Persecution, trials, tests, fears, compromises, these things and much more begin to break down trust and faithfulness. There's a statement, there's a statement that I've heard a famous ministry out there use from time to time. And he'll say in this ministry, it's not one of us, it's a ministry that's been out there for decades, and they'll play his old tapes at times, and he'll say, faithfulness is the word. That's the word. Faithfulness 
What does faithfulness mean to you or me, all of us? It means to remain resolute, steadfast in that relationship, closer to God, seeking to do those things that are pleasing in God's sight. I want you to go to 2 Peter, Peter's second letter, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter 1, the Apostle Peter wrote this second letter. He knew his time was short on earth. Peter knew that his time was about up. And you can read as you're turning to 2 Peter. Peter had been told there in the Gospel of John, that 21st chapter of the Gospel of John, when Christ had asked him three times, do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep, tend my sheep. In essence, Christ was saying, take care of my sheep. Love them, shepherd them. Peter knew why he was asked three times. Because he had previously denied Christ three times. But remember, as Christ finishes that little dialogue with Peter, he had told Peter, feet one day, one day feet will take you where you don't want to go. And that came to pass as Peter himself was taken to his own crucifixion. Christ was telling him the type of a death. He would also die one day. Feet will take you where you don't want to go. You know, wasn't in my notes. It just came in my thought process using those words of Christ. Where might feet take some of us one day that we don't want to go with persecutions mounting coming where will feet one day take some of us and they will one day in the great martyrdom the fifth seal of revelation is all about the great martyrdom of the saints when feet will come and take God's people to where they don't want to go that's when it's going to take tremendous faithfulness and trust in God. You're here in Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. I won't go through all these verses from verse 1, but I do want to come down to this, I call it the famous verse 10. Peter goes through this dialogue, and you can go back and read it again later, the previous verses, but he comes down after saying some profound things in the first nine verses, and in verse 10, he says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. And you can go back and read all those things that Peter talks about. And in verse 11, he says, For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is, if you do these things. Now, Peter's at the end of his life. When he wrote this letter, Peter knew that he's right there near the end of his life. And how many times do we go on and read following verse 11? Peter then gives the reason that he gave the church at that time the words he did. This is the same reason as a minister of Jesus Christ today that I give these words because I'm in agreement with Peter, verse 12. Therefore, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know them. You may sit out there at times and say, well, I already know that. What you got new today? I've heard that before. Can you tell me something I don't know? Can you tell me something new? And I'm like Peter here. He says, you already know them. And you are established in the present truth. You are established, brethren, I do believe, in this present truth. But then he says in verse 13, Yes, I think it is right, though, as long as I am in this tent, this physical tabernacle, alive, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. And that's a reference back to the end of John 21, when Christ had told him, Feet will take you at the end where you don't want to go. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. This is why we in the ministry 
are to continue to admonish all of you these things, even though you may know them. To remember how many times in the Old Testament did God say, remember, this day, the Sabbath day, that we're gathered here today. What does God say? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And how often do we give a message all along about this day, the Sabbath day, to what? Remember to keep it holy. Because we're human beings. We tend to forget, right? The greatest, let, let me rephrase this. My favorite book of the book of the law, the five books of the law, the Torah as it's called by the Jews, my favorite is the last one, the book of Deuteronomy. Moses, from God, instructing him, had taught Israel these things for 40 years. And he could have left it, God could have left it at four books. But no, he wrote and had Moses to chronicle and again write the book of Deuteronomy, which in my personal view is the capstone of the book of the law, the five books called the Torah. Because Deuteronomy, as I've always said, has such a new covenant flavor, so to speak, to it. And he said, tell them to remember. And this is what Peter is saying. Before I die, I want to stir up your remembrance that you always be reminded of these things because we must more than always, and I think most of all, be simply reminded because we get sloppy. Mining your dear friend, Ken Martin. I was having a personal conversation with Ken Martin three or four years ago at the ministerial conference. We were sitting there at breakfast talking, and Ken said, Ken Martin said, we get sloppy at times. He was talking about not in your housekeeping. He was talking about your spiritual housekeeping. We get sloppy at times. And I said, absolutely, Ken, we do. We get sloppy with our spiritual lives. We get off course and we have to get back on course and God has to set us back on course and that's the way the human realm is. That's the way we operate. And so Peter is saying, yes, I know you know these things. And he in essence is saying, I know you're grounded in it, but I must always remind you that we stay reminded most of all because we tend to forget and we tend to slip, and we tend to slide. And when those things happen, we begin to betray that relationship. We begin to do what? We begin to lose a certain connection with God. Turn to, I say the book of Jude. You can't call it a book. We call it that. It's a letter from Jude. You know Jude comes right before Revelation. Christ's brother Jude. It's a very short letter, yet a very powerful letter. The little letter of Jude, as you're turning there. Chapter 1, verse 13. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you, to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. I'm reading as I do most of the time from the New King James Version. And he says to contend earnestly for the faith. That faith that establishes that relationship between us and God. That trust between us and God. And when I say establishes that trust between us and God, how often that scripture of Job comes into my mind, and I can't remember now the exact chapter and verse in Job, but it's, it's what Job says that always at times comes back to my mind, especially if you're going through a severe trial, and even sometimes if you're facing a terminal illness. When Job said... To God, though you slay me, I will trust you. 
that came into my mind right now. Though you slay me, though you let me die, I will trust you. Brethren, there is no other means to have relationship with God other than through trust, belief, and faith in the promises that he's given to us all. And those promises are sure. And the best promises will not be realized until we are there one day in his kingdom. In verse 14 of Jude, he goes on, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. To deny Jesus Christ, to deny the things that he stands for, to deny the way of God. And there's no better way that I can put it than that. We just sang that song, page 119, about walking in that way as the song, as we sang it. It is the way of God. If someone were to ask me in a sense of saying, what way do you walk? What path do you walk? I walk in the way of God. Made me think of the minor prophet Michael where it says, this is the way, walk you in it. And that's the way it will be in the millennium. People will be told, this is the way, walk you in it. When we'll allow any form even of deception, any form of deception that deceives us is followed by a betrayal. Have you ever seen truth more betrayed than in our world today? Truth itself is being totally betrayed. You know, I said two weeks ago in the sermon, and I'll say it again, if you were to walk into the halls of Congress, maybe if they allowed me to walk into the halls of Congress when the full Senate and House is there, maybe throw in the president, I'd kind of like to walk in there and say, if I had the floor, if they gave me the floor for a moment, what is truth? Where is truth? What have you done with truth? Truth is being betrayed in every manner you can think about. Forget the blurring of sexes. That's what we used to hear. We used to hear the term, the blurring of the sexes. It's long ceased, gone from a blur to they don't know up from down. They can't read men on this door and women on that door. I'm being a little funny facetious. But anyway, that's calling good evil and evil good. Any action or words that turn traitorous in a relationship. And I say any words or actions that turn traitorous in a relationship will break the trust in that relationship Trust that may very well never be regained again. I say again, I have seen, I have seen in my lifetime, and I know you as adults have seen it, you've been involved in it. I've seen relationships broken that were never able to have the same footing again because when that trust is violated, it's very hard to restore that trust. Well, what about with us and God? I've known people who lost complete trust in God and turned their back on God. And that's the saddest of all. It's when unfaithfulness leads to a broken relationship with God himself. In Luke 18, verse 8. Luke 18, verse 8. Here's that scripture that I've quoted from a time or two even recently. Luke 18, verse 8. Jesus Christ says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? And I say again, 
Why would Jesus Christ be looking when he returns to find faith among those who are not yet called? There's no doubt in my mind, and hasn't been for a long, long time, that Christ is looking squarely at us, the church. Will I find faith when I return? Will there be faith existent? Faith, trust, again, is that spiritual adhesive that ties and binds us in relationship to God and Jesus Christ. It is again like the super glue that will bind us together that nothing can break it. And those of you who have used super glue, you know what I'm talking about. Don't get any of that on your fingers, by the way. Some of you probably have like I have. Whoa. Don't ever do it and get the finger. Whoa. Without that, there is no hope for relationship. And we must trust God in faithfulness all the way to the end. Because as Christ said, without turning there, those who endure to the end will be saved. Those who endure to the end. Those who stay the course. Those who remain steadfast. Those who remain in a trusting covenant of faithfulness to him, not ever letting fear, persecution, to compromise what he's given us. I want you to turn as I begin to put a wrap to the message. And before I tell you where to turn, I'll set it up this way. There are seal prophecies in this Bible. There are prophecies many prophecies that are sealed, not yet opened. I want you to go to one of those sealed prophecies that is not quite open yet. And of all places, it's Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul addressing a prophecy of things to come, a time to come, what I call a sealed prophecy, and much like what Daniel was told when Daniel was told through the visions and dreams he had, these are sealed prophecies. Seal them up because they will not happen to the end. What we read here in 2 Thessalonians 2 was what Paul gave to the church at Thessalonica 2,000 years ago, probably right on that mark, 2,000 years ago, give or take a little either way, and Paul gave this prophecy to a church then that thought it was going to happen in their time, apparently. And it's a seal of prophecy that has not yet been fully fulfilled. Let's just start in verse 1. As he tries to tell the church at that time at Thessalonica and explains to them about this prophecy that has not yet come to pass. Brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. And there was this, those who were teaching, those who were teaching that the resurrection had already happened. And Paul's having to deal with a kind of a heresy and kind of quail, the church at that time at Thessalonica, their fears because they knew something bad is coming and they thought it was going to come in their time. And then Paul goes on verse 3. It's kind of ironic. Paul jumps right into the heart of the matter. What did Christ do when in the Olivet Prophecy, the first thing out of the gate, we use the expression right out of the gate in the Olivet Prophecy again, when Christ says, be not deceived. What do we see here in verse 3? Paul says, let no one deceive you by any means for that day, and that day is capital, will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. That falling away. You can't fall away unless you have it, Right? You can't lose something unless you got it, right? Simple English. Unless you have the truth, you can't lose it. Unless you understand the truth, you can't fall away, right? This is a prophecy of even yet a time ahead of us. Four, verse four. And of course, the man of sin, the son of perdition, 
Paul is addressing the coming beast's power, primarily the great false prophet. Verse 4. I might insert the word he. He who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that, that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. A time coming from this personage will in essence declare himself God on earth and will compel the mass of humanity at first, no doubt, to worship him. And brethren, this has not happened yet. This is a sealed prophecy. And we're probably getting closer and closer to seeing this. I heard this week, my wife was telling me, my wife is usually right about three or four things she'll tell me. She was hearing this week, everything is pretty much, honey, ready for the temple to be built or do sacrifices in Jerusalem. Keep your eye on that. It is a synonymous seal. That is itself a seal prophecy that is about to be opened apparently. When Donald Trump as president was instrumental in having Jerusalem set up as the capital of Israel was not some coincidence. There is a purpose behind that. And that purpose that in God's hands is going to be yet manifested. There was a purpose that God no doubt wanted Jerusalem to be deemed the capital because of things that are going to start to happen. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Verse 5, do you not remember Paul says that when I was still with you, I told you these things. What's he saying? See, I told you these things. You know these things like Peter said, but I want to now to remind you. This is See, Paul's doing the same thing as Peter said. I want to, even though you knew these things when I told you before, I want to come back. I want to remind you. And that's what we do. We keep you in remembrance of these things. The ministry of Jesus Christ, most of all, is to keep you in reminding you in memory and remembrance of these things. Verse 6, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. He has not been revealed yet. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And can we say that for a fact? Lawlessness is already at work. And will increase. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And verse 8, then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So Paul is actually jumping forward even to what Revelation 19 says. And, I, and down the line, I'll be saying something in a sermon about that. In this verse 8, Paul is actually jumping from their time frame at Thessalonica all the way down to what? Revelation chapter 19 brings out when Christ comes back to set his kingdom up. And that's what Paul is referencing to. The beast's power will be destroyed when Christ returns. That's in chapter 19 also of Revelation. When he comes to rule with a rod of iron and set his kingdom up. And in chapter 19 of Revelation, you'll read it. Who is with him? The saints. You and I, the saints will be with him. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according, look at this, brethren, that our eyes not only see this, that we finally understand something. God is going to allow, in these times yet to come, he's going to allow Satan's power to be more and more utilized in punishment. Satan will be allowed to be an instrument in God's hands as punishments are poured out on the sons of Jacob, I gave those sermons here a while back, and he will allow Satan, that power that he has, he has much power, and he will be allowed by God to use that power, how? With power, signs, and lying wonders. He will allow these miracles, and guess who will be doing those miracles? No doubt. The great false prophet, Satan utilizing that power through the great false prophet. Because again, the great false prophet to come is the voice, is the voice of the beast. He empowers the beast. He influences the beast. As this happens. And verse 10. And with all unrighteous deception, that word again, with all unrighteous deception, among those who perish... 
because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. There will come the time. What did Christ say from the Olivet Prophecy again? Just to paraphrase it. It would be so compelling that the false prophet, his message, the miracles that Satan will do through him, it will be so compelling, as Christ said, that the very elect would almost be deceived. This deception that we see in our world today, the deceptions we see in the nation, the lies, the deception, that is minuscule compared to the great deception that is coming. And we may very well be closer than we think to that time frame. And see, Paul was having to tell the church at that time, 2,000 years or so ago, remind them, as Peter said, it's not time yet. And could have said, you'll be in your graves waiting for the resurrection. Paul says, verse 11, for this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It's very clear when you read these words of the Apostle Paul that when that time comes, you will have the greatest betrayal of truth itself that mankind has ever seen. That time that is coming when truth itself, if we think truth is under attack and assault now, a time when the truth, I should say lies and deceptions, will be masqueraded by the false prophet as God on earth that will cause the masses to believe, especially through those signs and powers and wonders that he will do. A time that Paul warned about. No generation of the church, no generation of the church has faced the prospect of this happening like us today. We now stand here closer and closer to that time frame. I've given this message today on betrayal. To simply, as Peter said, as Paul said, to keep us reminded to always keep it in front of our eyes, our focus, that the most important thing that we can do each day that we get up is to continue to maintain that faithful relationship with God and Jesus Christ. To maintain that faithfulness that no matter what comes or happens tomorrow, six months from now, a year from now, that we will remain faithful, that nothing will break that bond, that bond of trust, because the covenant between us and God is a covenant, ultimately, of trust. It's like if you had a physical father, and I had this physical father speak very personally, I had a physical father that I felt I could totally trust. And certainly our Father above, we can put complete trust in Him. We can put absolute complete trust in Him. And that's what it's going to take. That song in our song books that's lying here, page 167, God will see us through. Every time I think of that song or we sing it, Truly, God will see us through. And in the end, that's the only thing that's going to see us through to the very end of our life. Or if we live, some live in this room, some of the very youngest that might live to the actual return of Christ and would be standing on their feet changed in the twinkling of an eye, that that trust remains intact. That nothing can cause a breach of that trust and certainly with one another as the saints of God, certainly with us as his saints, certainly as brethren together, that we continue to work earnestly to maintain trust with one another, to remain faithful in the way we treat one another, how we speak to one another, 
And we don't do it perfectly by no means, do we? But we strive. And so, brethren, as you leave today, just be reminded, as Peter said in that last letter, to be stirred up and reminded of these things and that you never lose focus. And that statement that I love to use, I will close with. Above all, stay the course.